in order to, for example, learn how long each of the major carriers retains historical location information on each of us, right? And it varies substantially from company to company, so from six months to, in, in the case of at and you know, all location information is sent to July of 2008. Um, and I personally think that if I'm paying a bunch of money for, for uh, you know, a cell phone, it would be nice to have access to basic information about what kind of privacy risks the company creates by retaining that information for you know, months or even years at a time. Uh, I have a question for Ashwin. It's actually going to be more about technology than anything. That's your question. All right, of So one thing I think it's worth, so, so while uh, law enforcement may not go to any of these or these third party services yet, if there is a standard for, say, GPS information, um, we'll, we're, I think we are going to see law enforcement go uh, for other forms of location identification. And so, uh, Chris, you want to talk about the, um, the Skype uh, IP address? Uh, sure, there, there was a, a case uh, maybe five or six years ago. There was a, an American fugitive who was on the run, he disappeared. He was a, this is a white collar crime. Um, and he logged in from an internet cafe in Sri Lanka using Skype and made a single one minute call to one of his colleagues. And Skype handed over the IP address records of that call, which were sufficient to tip the police that he was in Sri Lanka. There are not that many Americans in Sri Lanka at any given time, and so it was pretty easy for them to then locate him after. Uh, so it's sometimes even country level location. So, so, so it depends on the purpose of the investigation, but you know, as we know, the data mining, you piece things together. And so perhaps precise GPS location might not. Um, you know, might, might have some protections down the line, we're going to find more and more that other types of location information might not have uh, the same type of protection. So, so my question to you, you described how Google can push down apps on, onto the, the phone without any user knowledge or consent. Um, you described how your GPS and other location information can be accessed. You, you, people do get told that you, there's no way to opt out of the government lo locating you. Um, if you were king for the day, and you could force the smartphone providers to change their systems, and you could force the carriers to change their, their technical systems. What would you do to protect people's privacy and security better on, in, in the smartphone environment? Yeah, so I, I think the one thing that I would probably focus on, so would, there's two things. One, one is um, for retroactive request for information, I would um, push on bigger, broader retention of things, right? So um, I think, uh, you know, you've talked about cooking. How they don't log information. So they don't, if you don't have that information, law enforcement can't go and get that information. So, so you're, you're saying that AT&T's seven year law retention period is, is too much? It might, I mean, you know, you, you might not. I think you guys use AT&T? Seven years, you go with that? No. <laughs> well, what, what else uh, for everyone on the panel? You know, what, what, what other pressure can consumers put here and what other pressure should consumers put here? So we talked about how the mobile carriers should be more transparent about how long they retain data and shouldn't retain it for as long as they do. Um, you know, we've praised companies for putting out transparency reports that say how many times they get different kinds of requests. Google and Twitter have done that. Um, we praise Twitter because when they get subpoenas for customer records, they notify the users so that they will have an opportunity to challenge that in court, although courts uh, have sometimes said that users don't even have standing to do that. What should we as you know, customers and consumers be pushing um, these companies to do more? Well, so I would say for this crowd, we as uh, <laughs> researchers and developers and actors, and whatever we call ourselves, uh, uh, highlighting some of these, these activities, like this collection of information, the transmission of information, um, you know, finding tasteful ways to demonstrate privacy exposure so that when you like, don't have to center it, but like, you might want to show that the senator when they're using their phone and who they're in their location when they're going to the strip club. Uh, you can make that case. I think you know, senators are going to be, uh, their, their eyes are going to be open and they're going to want to find ways to um, protect that information. That's typically how um, I find that, that people pay attention to issues is when it affects them. And so that as, as people that are very capable, probably much more so than anyone at the panel, I would say you know, if you have ways to demonstrate how sensitive information is being Stored and securely transmitted to people that would and, and legally uh, and, and legally demonstrate this stuff um, and generally would surprise most average consumers. I think that's a really good use of your time. I second that. So I think the most perverse aspects of, of the tracking debate and this and the surveillance state we live in 
the really the thing that bothers me the most, I think, is really twisted, is that if you get arrested and the government uses location information to find you or to build a case, you'll be told about it. If the government is reading your emails and somehow they find something you know uh, problematic there and they use it to build a case and they arrest you and prosecute you, in the course of your prosecution, you will learn that the government is digging through your most private and sensitive affairs. But if you're innocent, if you've committed no crime, and the government never charges you with anything, in so many of these requests, in so many of these forms of surveillance, you never know about it. If Google hands over your search box, you don't know about it. If the government obtains your cell tower location data, if they look through your emails, if they find out your credit card transactions, or your public transportation records, or your easy pass toll booth records, you never learn about it. And I think it's really, really messed up that the innocent in this country can be subject to surveillance and, and, and not know that, that it occurs. And I want to be clear that under US law, for most forms of surveillance, unless the government specifically obtains an order prohibiting disclosure, companies are free to tell you. They just don't do it. It's bad for business. They don't want to scare their customers. They don't want to worry people. And frankly, they get no benefit out of doing so. And I understand that. I understand why the companies don't want to do that. And I think we should change the law so that the government is required to tell you uh, when they obtain your stuff. And that doesn't mean they need to tell you the day that they request your records. Certainly, you know, that could frustrate a, a, a legitimate investigation. But at some point, whether it's six months or a year or two years down the road, at some point, you should be told the government is looking through your personal private files. And right now, you just don't know. I think that's a really excellent point. When you start seeing numbers like 1.3 million you know, records being accessed, the number of those people who are innocent has actually got to be quite substantial. And I just wanted to build off of Chris's point by talking about the mechanics uh, by which the government gets these orders. Even when they go to court um, to get an order as sometimes required by the law, they generally do so in proceedings where the government is the only party. Right? The government goes and says, I need this surveillance order to be granted. Uh, for an investigation, and the defendant, of course, isn't told that they're about to be subjected to surveillance for good reason, right? The investigation is not going to be effective if the person is told that their cell phone is about to be tracked. Um, but unfortunately, what this does is it subverts the adversary process, right? In general, judges get to listen to both sides of arguments before making decisions. And um, the surveillance requests the government has submitted have gotten broader and broader and broader over time, and the judges don't have anyone on the other side to help them understand it. So, um, for example, there was a case we uncovered called United States versus Soto, which was in Connecticut, in which it turned out, it ended up being an example of a case where the government submitted a request to engage in tracking, not just of the one individual they thought had engaged in wrongdoing, but of everyone else who had called that person's cell phone which ended up being about 180 other people. Um, and the judge simply signed off on this order. Um, but these orders aren't clear, clearly written. They're, they're quite confusing and difficult to understand. And I think the way in which they're gotten just by the government without anyone else in court to make the arguments in favor of privacy is, is one of the reasons we've seen such a rampant expansion of surveillance. So now it's just those of us for whom one hour of this is not enough. <laughs> Uh, and we'd like to invite questions and comments because we don't have a microphone for that. So those 